Good morning. Uh, welcome to the first edition of View on Africa this year. Um, I hope you all had a restful holiday period and are ready for the, the new challenges in, on the continent this year. My name is Stephanie Walters. I'm the head of the Conflict Prevention and Risk Analysis Division. And I'm going to be talking today about um, one of the uh, key crises on the continent, and that is, is Burundi. Um, the issues I'm going to review are essentially developments since the December 17th decision of the Peace and Security Council of the African Union to deploy troops to Burundi. So I'll review some of the details around that, discuss the possibilities for that, what hurdles remain, where things stand. And the other issue that I'll be looking at closely is also the talks that are meant to be taking place uh, between the Burundian government and Burundian civil society, and which are now um, at, a, at an impasse, essentially, as, a, as, of, as of last week. Um, I will Um, I will also just very, very briefly touch on some of the regional issues um, when I talk about um, the AU, presidential AU deployment and so on. So um, without further ado, um, since we last did a briefing on Burundi at the end of November, which followed our field trip to, to, to Bujumbura, um, there have been really a number of things that have happened. Um, the situation has continued to worsen. Uh, in terms of human rights violations and, and general instability and uncertainty. And I think the most uh, visible event or th that we've had was the attack on December 11th uh, by about 30, un uh, by 30 armed assailants on, on, on military camps in, um, in and outside of Bujumbura. And the subsequent crackdown by the Burundian security forces on civilians, really, in the, in the contested um, areas of Bujumbura, which is largely estimated to have killed over 100 people. Um, the, the response to that has been essentially that the, 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 the Burundian security services response was disproportionate um, and that it didn't necessarily relate. In other words, the people who were, who were killed by the security forces were not necessarily those who had committed the attack. And that has really put, um, put the, 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 the extent of the insecurity and of, of, the, of, the, of the violence in, in Burundi um, in, in, into a new level. Subsequent to that, there was the deployment of an African Union, um, the African Union's Commission on Human Rights, a team of, of, of commissioners traveled to Bujumbura to look at the situation. Um, and then subsequent to that, there was this very important decision by the PSC to deploy these 5,000 uh, troops to Burundi. Um, and I think that you know, we, we, there's no question for me that, that, that certainly the report of the UN commissioners would have influenced the strength of the PSC's decision um, to, to intervene in Burundi. I think it's become quite clear over the last few months that what we lack in terms of resolving this, this crisis is time. We don't have a lot of time. Um, as we see more attacks happening, both by the armed opposition and retaliation and attacks by the Burundian security services, um, we, we, we edge ever, ever closer to some kind of larger scale violence, potentially on an ethnic uh, basis, although that hasn't yet been the case. And I think we need to emphasize that. But again, the real issue at this point is time. And so both the talks and what happens with the deployment of the AU troops um, are of the essence. Um, now, Burundi, after the PSC took the decision to deploy 5,000 troops, what, what does that actually mean? What it means is that this is, a re this, is, this is what the PSC would like to happen. Um, the Burundian government had 96 hours to respond, um, positively or negatively, to that deployment. It has now, it has clearly said, uh, we do not uh, want such a deployment. Um, and Nkurunziza went one step further to say later in, in, in December that, in fact, um, Burundian army would attack AU forces were they to deploy against the will of the Burundian government. Um, that doesn't mean that the force can't deploy. What we will now see is a deliberation at the AU summit in January in Addis, and the decision to deploy will then be put to a vote of the General Assembly. It will need to get a two-thirds majority in order to pass and for that deployment to go ahead. So the stakes are extremely high for the African Union and for Burundi. For the African Union, this is the first time that they've invoked the African Charter on Democracy and Human Rights, which allows them to intervene in crises um, where um, 
where there were, and, 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 and situations of great instability in an African country, even overriding the, the will of the host government. Um, but this is this is a this is a very serious issue. We we when we look at some of the, the the statements that have been made since then, it's quite clear that the African Union understands what the stakes are. We've seen uh, PSC Commissioner Smile Chergi uh, try and tone down the tensions between the African Union and Burundi. Um, we've seen a number of regional presidents, uh, people like um, Magufuli of Tanzania, suggest that there won't be a deployment unless. Uh, there is uh, agreement by the host government, um, but we, we, th this is a very crucial situation. Where do we think, do we think um, the, Af the General Assembly will vote for this deployment? I think it's, it's not terribly useful to speculate. We'll, we'll have the answer to that quite soon. But just to point out that uh, it, it is setting an important precedent, and I think it's a precedent that will, will perhaps in frighten a number of African governments, the suggestion that you can have an African Union force deployed to your country against your will if there's instability, that's, that's something that has never happened and it, it, it's not likely to be an easy decision. Um, and I, I suspect that we, we won't see an approval, but we, we will know more about that um, at, the end of, at the end of the year, at the end of January. Um, there seems to be some suggestion that an alternative or a way of making this more palatable to the Burundian government is to phase in this deployment. We know that at the moment there are um, about 12 human rights observers, AU human rights observers on the ground, and there are an equal number of military observers. The mandate of the human rights observers is to observe um, the human rights situation, and the mandate of the military observers is to assist with the disarmament of some of the militias that have, um, have, have uh, cropped up since the start of the, the protest earlier this year. Now, these, these, these two separate contingents are very small. Both are meant to be at a total of 50 people, so 50 human rights observers and 50 um, African, uh, sorry, 50 military observers. That hasn't been possible because the Burundian government has not yet signed the Memorandum of Understanding with the African Union. And so if S uh, augmenting that force hasn't been possible at this, at this stage. The suggestion of the first phase of, of, the, of, the, of the deployment of the AU force, which, just so you know, already has an acronym, and that acronym is MAPROBU, um, would be to expand those numbers. So I would imagine to bring them to their full complement. Um, and have that complement of military observers and human rights observers be accompanied by a small protection force. Um, depending on how the situation evolves, a second phase could then involve the deployment of infantry and police units. And the third phase would be contingent on the conclusion of, of a political deal uh, where essentially the, the rival parties or the government and the, and the civil society groups and the op political opposition will have come to a political deal that will then be implemented or will then be monitored by the full African Union force. So that, the, that's the suggestion that that might be the way in which the, the force is deployed. I think, again, when I, I started the presentation by mentioning how important timing is, um, the longer this uncertainty goes on, the longer both sides accuse one another of uh, gross human rights violations, the more tensions will rise. So we, we have a real problem at the moment um, where we have something somewhat nebulous called the, un, the armed opposition. We don't really know what the nature of it is. Um, we know. We have a few names. We have, for example, a publicly declared by Edouard and Shimi Rimana, a former head, a former um, member of the Burundian army, declared the formation of the Force Republicaine du Burundi, so Republican Forces of Burundi, um, whose aim it is to reverse the, the, the mandate of Nkuru Visa. So we know that they exist. There's also something called the Résistance pour l'État de droit, which is another group that um, exists, but again, we don't really know uh, who it's led by, or necessarily where it's based, what its resources are, what its aims are. Um, there is not enough information about the, uh, the armed opposition. And one of the difficulties is, in, is, is that the, the unarmed opposition, so the political opposition, groups like the MSD and other, other key political parties whose leaders are in exile, are potentially also linked to that armed violence, but we don't yet know the extent of those links. We don't know if they're still willing to pursue, perhaps, a resolution through 
uh, negotiated means, although they, they, they do say that. Um, and we don't know the extent of preparation for this type of, of, of escalation. Um, and that is, a, that is a very big issue. Obviously, the, the Burundian government waives this as a, as a justification for its heavy crackdowns on, uh, on Burundian civilians, in, especially in Bujumbura, but increasingly also outside. Um, but we, we simply don't have a real assessment of the nature of that threat. Um, and that is one of the reasons that the timing is so important. We, we are watching it very closely because we worry that in this, in this repressive climate where really anybody who walks outside of their home could be the target of some kind of um, act of violence, people are becoming more afraid. Uh, we have very little independent information reaching Burundians. There are a number of international media that are still, of course, covering Burundi. But internally, there's very little information circulating. Um, and, 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 and the key here, obviously, is to try and avoid a, a, a full slide into civil war, um, which, which is, is very much a, a potential risk at this stage. Um, the key issues in this dynamic um, is, is the regional one. We, we know that the relationship between Rwanda and Burundi is very tense. Um, Burundi has firmly declared that it believes that Rwanda is supporting the armed opposition against it. Uh, we had a report from Refugee International at the end of last year stating that they had um, discovered that there were, in fact, uh, um, combatants, that there was training of, of armed combatants in some of the uh, Burundian refugee camps that have sprung up in Rwanda, um, which is a, is a very big threat to Burundi. Um, and we have, other, we have other information about the fact that potentially Rwanda might be, at least tacitly, but possibly also actively supporting the, the development of, these, um, of, of, of this, these, these armed groups. And, and that is a very serious issue because a regional uh, conflict is, of course, would, would of course be devastating. Um, at the same time, what we have now are, are increasing sightings, so to speak, of um, Burundian rebels in eastern DRC. Uh, we had a, a report uh, from the Congolese government, or a suggestion from the Congolese government that, um, that, the, that Burundian rebels are now linking up with M23 rebels in the eastern part of the country. Um, this too uh, is not confirmed, but what, what we're seeing is that conflict dynamics that are already existing are being taken advantage of by different parties in Burundi and are also feeding into the situation. Um, by the same token, we've had suggestions that the FDLR are closely uh, involved with the Burundian government and may form elements of the different security services, the parallel security services that are executing some of the, some of the, the, the greater violence in, 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 the, in the country. These are, these are things that are, the FDLR issue is, is not yet confirmed independently, but it is, it is something that, that a lot of people um, have evoked and, and feel is very real. So the regional dimension, both with tensions with, the, uh, with Rwanda and alliances between like-minded rebel groups in, in eastern DRC in Rwanda and in Burundi is a very real threat. So again, timing and de-escalating this crisis is, is, is essential. Um, which brings me really to the second subject today, which is the, the, the ongoing, well, the talks. Um, that are supposed to be taking place between the, the Burundian government and uh, the uh, political opposition. We had, um, th these talks are being led uh, by Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni. Uh, they are under the auspices of the East African community. And they started, in fact, um, before elections took place uh, in, in, in June last year. They didn't really come to much, um, didn't have an impact on, on the timing or obviously the outcome of the elections. And they have since resumed in face of a, of a much worsened situation of greater instability. Um, they, it, it has taken a very long time to get them started. There have been a number of visits prior to, to their, them being launched at the end of, uh, end of 2015. Um, visits by uh, Ugandan Defense Minister Christos Kinyonga to Burundi to try and find uh, common ground on who the participants should be and what the agenda is. And the talks were then finally started uh, on the 28th of December. Um, I believe it's the 28th. In any case, at that initial meeting, very little was accomplished uh, other than statements being read by the various different participants um, who were from civil society, the Ugandan government, uh, sorry, the Burundian government, and the Sinared, the Sinared being the, 
uh, opposition platform that has been formed um, amongst the key uh, political opposition groups. Um, the resolution at the end of those those very initial uh, talks was that they would resume in Janu on January 6th in Arusha, um, still under the auspices of Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni and the EAC. Unfortunately, that did not happen. The, the Burundian government announced that it would not be able to attend those talks. Um, there was a suggestion then that perhaps the 15th, so in other words, uh, I think Friday this week, there would be a resumption. But since then, the government has made a number of statements saying that they are not willing to discuss, uh, to meet, to negotiate with the Senared uh, because, the Senare, because of the Senared's involvement in the armed opposition and in crimes that that armed opposition has committed. So the situation would seem to be at an impasse at this stage. Um, we have seen Christos Kinyonga pushing very hard um, and being very vocal about the need to resume those talks. And so we, 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 this is a positive thing that, that Uganda is trying very hard to keep those talks on, on, on track. He's also been quite vocal about the need for the African Union force to be deployed. Um, this has not surprisingly prompted some angry responses from the Burundian government. Um, and so there's a little bit of a, of a back and forth there on that, on, on that particular issue. Um, regional leaders do seem committed to keeping, to keeping this, this dialogue process going. But I must say that at this point, with the African Union summit looming um, and, 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 and people digging in heels, I don't anticipate that those talks will commence before the African Union summit um, and before we know better what kind of a decision comes out of that General Assembly about the deployment. Um, so at the, the last comment I want to make, or the last issue I want to talk about a little bit is, is um, efforts that are being made by other regional envoys, by other countries, um, and also by the United Nations. So the um, EU talks, which were crucial for um, the continued provision of aid to Burundi, the EU accounts for a large amount of aid that Burundi receives, and aid counts for close to 50% of Burundi's budget. Um, those talks did not come to a, a, a positive resolution, and so there has been no resumption, uh, or there, 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 there's, there's no, uh, the specter of a cut in that aid is still very real. Uh, there were some very key benchmarks about reopening uh, media and, and, and allowing for civil society to, to, to work freely that simply weren't met. So the EU is still very much at odds with the Burundian government. Um, regional envoys, especially um, Said Jinnit from uh, the United Nations and also Thomas Periello of the US, remain extremely engaged. Uh, Periello has just started a visit today to the region um, to try and uh, move the talks forward or get the different parties back to the negotiating table and obviously also around the, 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 the upcoming AU um, summit. The interesting thing about the Americans, and it's not really clear why, but they've suggested that the talks be moved to Arusha, um, whereas they had previously been quite happy to, to maintain them in Uganda. I, I don't know what the reason for that is. It's possible that um, there are concerns about unrest in Uganda as Uganda is going through its own political, uh, its own um, uh, elections campaign. That may well be the reason. Um, Arusha seems like a neutral enough site, so I, I don't imagine that that location is really the issue at this point. Um, now, the, the UN, some interesting things coming out of the UN, not officially, but some leaked documents about um, how the UN could assist and how it could respond to the crisis in Burundi. Obviously, if the AU Assembly does approve a deployment, it will still need to be approved by the UN, and there will have to be uh, strong resource support, uh, resources coming from the United Nations and also from other international organizations to support that deployment to Burundi. Um, and, and so it will take some time and it will not be the final hurdle, but it will be the key hurdle uh, in terms of political will to actually do that. Um, the, the UN obviously, I think um, that is a preferred choice and it should be a preferred choice because it's an African uh, Situation, um, and it would be it would be it would be a good thing if the African Union could take that important step. But the AU has the UN is obviously also planning, um, and it has to plan because we we simply don't know 
when things, if things will go, uh, will escalate more significantly, and if they do, how quickly and in exactly what guise? Will it be along ethnic lines? Will it lead into a regional conflict? So these are all scenarios that are very possible and which must be planned for. Now this, this leaked UN memo um, really outlines a, one of the ways in which the UN is hamstrung, and it's not specific to Burundi, but it's now been highlighted in the context of Burundi. And essentially what they're saying is that the UN at this point could try and assist with, you know, helping the AU out with an interposition force and, and contributing some troops and some resources to that. But if it were to come to a regional conflict or an all-out civil or, or a situation of genocide, then the UN simply wouldn't have the ability to halt uh, uh, civilian death. And, 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 and what they've, what they, the, the scenarios that they've envisaged are, are the, the situation that we have now, some kind of you know, low-level violence, ongoing instability, um, where an intervention might still be useful. Then there is the regional uh, conflagration. And then there is the possibility of, 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 of it turning into a genocidal um, situation as well. In the latter two, uh, the kind of deployment that the UN has envisaged, there are two possibilities. One is that um, troops could be taken from MONUSCO in neighboring DRC, which would obviously be efficient and quick. Um, concerns there are that the troop contributing countries that are deployed to MONUSCO um, might not be willing to deploy into a much more active combat zone um, in Burundi. And so there's a question of getting permission from those many different countries that have troops stationed in the eastern DRC or in, in DRC in general. Um, and the second concern is that this could create a vacuum in DRC at a time when they themselves face a potential heightened civil unrest as a result of their elections, which are due to take place at the end of this year uh, or over the course of the next year. Um, so that, the, those are the, 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 the big concerns there. Um, and, and it highlights really the fact, again, that we, we simply don't have a lot of time here. Um, I mean, the General Assembly would, I think, be making a very bold decision if they did go ahead with the deployment. Um, and it would be a decision that would, in my view, um, really save civilian lives. Uh, I think that the de-escalation that we are all hoping for isn't going to happen until we have that neutrality, those neutral eyes on the ground. Uh, in, the, in the shape of, of, of African Union observers and an African Union presence. Um, now, obviously, one of the questions is, you know, in whose, I mean, in whose favor is such a deployment? The Burundian government has made its position very clear. It opposes such a deployment. I, I can understand that it would be perhaps humiliating to be the first African country to be hosting reluctantly an AU, uh, uh, an AU force. Um, but by the same token, the Burundian government could choose to welcome such a deployment and say, we want the return of stability. Um, it, it, has, it, has, it is constantly making reference to the existence of an armed uh, opposition, so it technically should have an interest in having a force there that could prevent that armed resistance or that armed opposition from growing. That doesn't seem to be the logic that, is, that, that the Burundian government is following. Um, so there is that question about <coughs> what the political will is. By the same token, um, it is entirely possible that members of the armed opposition, we don't, we don't know this yet, um, also aren't that interested in resolving this through negotiations and feel that they'll get a, a greater slice of the pie, so to speak, or have a greater chance at entering government if they do so uh, through some kind of war. Um, but I think that we, we are seeing a lot of very reckless behavior on behalf of some of the leadership coming out of Burundi and possibly in the region as well around this issue. Um, uh, of what's happening there. Um, I'm just going to quickly, I think that that about covers it. Um, so thank you. <laughs>